Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Before we get going here, there's an announcement I want to call your attention to in your bulletin. It is August 1st. Um, Jacob and Serena are getting married on August 1st. Jacob said he was a little, he was nervous and a little bit frightened. I said, good. It's a start. So, but anyhow, they wanted to let you know that you guys are invited. It's on Saturday. They've got a little sheet back there to sign up so they know how, you know, how many people are coming and all that sort of thing. So what they want to expect. All right? I'd love to have you. Um, anything else I need to announce? Movie night. Movie night. You're on there? Yeah. yeah. Movie night. Right there where it says movie night. 17. Bring your own popcorn. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that we can gather together in your name. Lord, that we can gather in fellowship and know that where two or three of us are, Lord, there you are. And you are with us, Lord Jesus. And Lord, as always, we pray that you would show yourself to us in your word today. That you would teach us and then use us, Lord Jesus, to glorify your name. Lord, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Open your Bibles to the book of the Revelation. Once again, we notice that that is not plural. The revelation it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. We look at this, and so far in the first part of chapter one, we see where Jesus has a couple times referred to himself as the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, and the end. And it points not only to him being eternal, but him being all knowing. I always get to that where I start to ponder the idea of God being all-knowing. It either comforts you or just scares you to death, depending on you know, what's going on. God knows everything. And yet here we are. God is all-knowing. He knows the beginning from the end. It's not like He's making it up as we go, which is what most of us do, right? We, we don't know the beginning from the end. We can't remember where we started and we don't know where we're going. The only thing we got for sure is that Jesus said to be absent from the body is to be present with Him. He said He's coming back one day. We're going to meet Him in the, in the clouds and there we'll be with Him always. All right, that's good because we can get lost. We can wander off and go astray. <laughs> because sometimes we're not always that good at following Him. He tells Him to write these letters to the seven churches which are in Asia. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And then I turned, in verse 12, he says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as, a, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. We read that a little bit last week here and noted that throughout the Gospels, there's no account or description, physical description of Jesus Christ, is there? Close as we get is in Isaiah where it talks about he had no form of comeliness. Meaning the dude wasn't good looking. Yeah, it was just Jesus. And he, he fit in. He melted right into the crowd. He didn't stand out in any way. There were times when they were trying to get him and stuff, and he just turned around and disappeared. Right into the rest of them. Even after he'd been there and ministered and done all the things that he did when they came to the 
garden of Gethsemane to get him. They had to have Judas come up and say, all right, you tell us which one he is. In our minds, our imaginations, and everything, we think that Jesus would have been really easy to spot, huh? After all, he had that little shiny plate on the back of his head. <laughs> like in all the pictures. There was nothing there because as he came, and he came and, and dwelt among us in the flesh, he became like us. But he did that to show us the glory of God. This we see the Lord, the King of Kings, here. In some way glorified. We see the white, the pure white of his hair. The gold around his chest. That, that, that kingly stuff. Um, the, the feet of brass. The judgment. Refined by fire. Those eyes. Those eyes of, of Jesus. The refiner's fire. No wonder we mentioned it. I thought about it often what it must have been like for Peter as that rooster crowed that third time. And Jesus turned and looked at him as he denied him. He denied him that third time. And Jesus looked at him. The eyes of love and compassion. The eyes of fire that refined. Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord, the Judge. We see a different picture of him here in this description. Glorified, risen Lord. He had in his right hand the seven stars, and out of his mouth was a two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. Out of his mouth went that two-edged sword. You ever handle a knife with a sharp on both sides? It's kind of tricky, doesn't it? You gotta know what you're doing. You gotta be careful. That's why I don't do it. <laughs> One side's good enough. But that mouth, that, that sword that comes out of his mouth, the word of God. The Bible tells us that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword that divides down to the marrow and everything. The word of God that, that is capable of doing that surgery in our lives spiritually. And it's sharper and more delicate and more capable than any surgeon that might do brain surgery. It's able to divide everything, anything spiritually in our lives. It's that truth, it's that sword that is that part of our armor that we hold on to. That is both defensive, because the Word of God's truth, the, the victory that we have in Jesus and who He is and those promises that we have in Him and our position in Christ defend us, don't they? Knowing who He is and His love for us that defends us, that comforts us, that protects us. We're knowing that we have victory in Jesus and the battle is already won because He's the Alpha and the Omega. There's no if when we come to these things, is there? We look at him, there's no if he is gracious, if he is merciful, if he is victorious, if he is almighty. Because he is. And that word of truth that defends us, that comforts us, and that word of truth that offends, it's also the only offensive weapon. You ever been offended by the word of God? Unbelievers are. Can you remember being an unbeliever? Were you ever offended by the Word of God? Oh, yeah. And the same Word that defends you now offended you then. It was offensive. It holds the enemy back. It holds them at bay. So we have that double-edged sword that works both ways. His countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. You ever look straight into the sun? Well, it takes a little while for all the little dots to go away so you can see something else for a while. The brightness of the Lord, His countenance is bright and shiny. It says, it tells us that when the new heaven and the new earth, there's not going to be any need for the sun or anything because Christ will be the light that shines. Back in Genesis, before it talked about the sun being created, there was the light. This light that came from the Lord. God said, let there be light. And there was light. See, his countenance bright and shining. Far different pic picture than the meek and mild Jesus that we think of. 
isn't it? Jesus our Savior and Jesus our Lord, King of Kings. Very different pictures that we have. Verse 17 says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen? And I have the keys to Hades and of death. <clears throat> Write the things which you have seen, and let the and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. John walked with Jesus, saw him on the cross, was there when he ascended, knew the risen Lord, and yet when he sees Jesus, King of Kings here, he falls down dead. He is amazed. He is in awe. <laughs> we talked about that day that we're going to get to see Jesus face to face. Which face do we picture? This is what we're going to see, I believe. So he fell at his feet as dead, overwhelmed by this. And he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Do not be afraid. We know that in the presence of the Lord, we not, need not be afraid, do we? We don't dread this day. We talk about the, the rapture of the church that can happen at any moment. We get excited about that. Yay! Let's go! We look at these things and we know that the times are going to get progressively harder and more difficult for people. And if we join in in the end of, of this book of Revelation and say, Mary not the come Lord Jesus, come. We rejoice at the idea of being in His presence. Not fear that time. I have no fear in the Lord because we know that we're, 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 we abide in the love of Christ. Our Lord and our Savior. When you think of one day being absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. How do you picture that? And here John says this Jesus is very different. Don't be afraid though. He says, for I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Life and death are in Jesus' hands, aren't they? It's one of the things I think it's very important for us to remember as believers. That our life, life and death, are in His hands. Condemnation and salvation are in His hands. Jesus is in charge of these things, isn't He? We can choose whether to remain in our condemnation or we can choose to accept the forgiveness of Christ and that gift of everlasting life and go and be in His presence and look forward to this day. Or not. Remember who holds the keys. People get concerned and often in, 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 in times like this that, you know, as this coronavirus started, we were reminded that, hey, you know what, there's always something that, that's there that might kill you. And one thing that we know for certain is that this life ends in death or the rapture, right? For a believer, one way or another, you're not getting out of it with this. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I want to take this with me. <laughs> but he has the keys. He was appointed once for men to die and then the, the, the judgment. Have you, ever, have you ever missed or been late for an appointment? Yeah? Better yet, have you ever been to a doctor or someone when you had an appointment at a certain time and you sit there for another 45 minutes waiting for them? The Lord knows the number of our days. 
Remember, he's all knowing. He knows exactly how and when each one of us will depart from this raggedy old tent and be present with him. And that has been set down in stone, if you want to call it that, from before the foundations of the earth were ever laid. And just as these promises and these things that Jesus is talking about right here and right now, these things that must happen, that will take place, are sure and certain, so is that day. Well, good, but I can do anything I want to until then. It's that whole point. Well, you, there's a lot of horrible things you can live through. <laughs> you know? It, you can be a mess and beat up and broken and all that kind of stuff and still live through that. But that day's coming. And it's sure, it's certain. And it is in the Lord's hands. Not your doctors. Not somebody else's. It's in the Lord's hands. We look at that, we see the circumstance of, you know, people that that, that, that that died from COVID and all that other stuff, things that, that happen, accidents that happen, children who, whose lives are ended, in our opinion, way too soon. And we look at that, we don't get it, we don't understand. And it's not for us to always understand. But we know that those things are in His hand. Don't we? Or do we? Yet so often we go, what if? If I'd have done this, if I had done something different, maybe. No. That's the enemy doing that. It says in verse 19, it says, Write these things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. And in that he gives us this outline for this book of Revelation. The things which he's seen. Those are the things that we're talking about now that John is observing as we read this first chapter. What do you see? Write it down. The things which are. These are the things of the church. As we mentioned before, as we go into these letters to the seven churches, the seven is, is always something to do with being complete. There were these seven churches, but there were more churches there in Asia. There are churches all over the place. Some commentators look at this and, they, and they, they draw some analogies between these different churches and different periods of time in church history. And that's a little interesting. You know, I'm not quite convinced that's what the point is, but you can see some, some things there. But it looks at the church, the church in its completeness. From beginning to whenever. Because after this, after the seven letters to the church, the things which are, it moves into the things which must take place. And you don't see the church anymore, except at the marriage. So, and coming back. There's a time when you're going to say, I wish I had a horse now. You ever ride a horse? We rode some horses up in Montana. And you know what? For some reason, those things have become more uncomfortable than they used to be. <laughs> <laughs> They're fun. These things which are the church, the church age. As we look at these seven churches, we're going to see those things. We're not really going to talk about the seven things in the history of the church and everything so far. Because I don't care about that. Um, but what we're going to see is we're going to see seven churches. And we can see, if you look around, you notice things, and if you you know much about other things, you can see these things, these same characteristics in churches today. As there were then. You can look at this and you can look at the, the, the church at Ephesus and as we read about that, you can go, well, there's some churches like that. And then you can think about it a little bit more and you can look at that and we're like, yeah, so, you know, I know Christians that fit that description. Because we are the church, aren't we? I know some Christians that fit that description, and you can look at that and apply it a little bit more. You can say, some days I'm that church. You can look at this and say, which church are you? Well, it depends on the day sometimes, doesn't it? But those things and those characteristics of the church, we remember that we are the church. We are the church. It doesn't matter the location, does it? doesn't matter the, the time and history or whatever. We are the church. 
And so those letters and those things, they, they address us and the things that we need to look at and see where we fit. They encourage and they correct and they warn us. And those are the things that we should have as we go on this, ears to hear. In other words, pay attention to what the Spirit is telling you. What the Spirit is telling us as a church. What the Spirit is telling the church as a whole. This is right, these things that are. And the things which will take place after this. Earlier in chapter 1 it said to be things that must take place. Again he says those things that will take place. As we know the word of the Lord and his nature and his character and everything, when he says these things must and these things will, we know one thing for certain. It's going to happen. The Bible says God ever told us something was going to happen and it didn't. Oh. Word is sure and true and trustworthy. And trustworthy. These things must and they will take place. We don't know the exact timeline. We're able to discern the seasons. We're able to understand that, that, that as we move through time, just because it's another day, we're getting closer. Do we take that to heart? Does it affect the way that we live our lives? This was written in about 96 AD. That's been a while ago. There is a sense of urgency. And there still is, isn't there? Or do we fall into to those that want to take these things and, and put them back? It's later on that they were just you know, figuratively speaking that these things are going to happen. Or do we want to look at them as a story? Well, that stuff will happen before 70. Well, it couldn't have happened before 70 because we've written that. Those things have already happened. Or do we see that they will? Then write down these things which will take place after this, after the time of the church. So the mystery of the seven stars which you saw on my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven, seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands, stands which you saw, are the seven churches. The angels of the seven churches, some look at that and they say, well, he's talking about the pastors of the church, the messengers, or the message that the Lord gives the church, the anointed message that's delivered, hopefully, through the pastors. He looks at those, those seven angels, stars the seven angels, the anointed message that God gives to us as a church. I'm looking at it and say, well, you know, each church has an angel. Blah, blah, blah. Angel in that is a messenger. The messenger of God to those churches. To all the churches. And the seven Aaron says in the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. What is a lampstand used for? Ornamental decoration, right? No? Holding the light. Holding the light. The lampstands were those oil burning lights and all stuff to get light. We are the light, aren't we? Yes. The salt and the light. We are the church, and that's what we're to do, to shine the light in the darkness. The light of Christ this shine, shines as the sun. To do that. Chapter 2. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. And have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Starts off pretty good, doesn't it? Like, all right, yeah, all right. Ephesus, doing pretty good. 
It starts out to write to the angel. It gives something in here that relates to this description of Christ and having the, the seven stars and the lamp's hands. It says, I know your works, your labors, your patience. They're good things to have noticed, isn't it? If we talk about that, as we see the things we do, as we look at one another, as we look at churches, we want those who are laboring for the Lord, serving the Lord. Those who are patient. I don't have a lot of patience with Christians that aren't very patient. I want to see that patience, the perseverance that they have. <clears throat> he said, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Too often, the church compromises on too many different things. It's not talking about so much being legalistic, but dealing with those things. Calling them out. Things that are wrong. A call to righteousness. A call to holiness. A call to purity. The Bible tells us as believers to, to flee youthful lust and do what? Pursue righteousness. To put off the things of the, the sinful man and put on the right, put on Christ to do those things. He sees those things. We don't like those things. It says those things that are that are evil. It says and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. One of the things, and if they look at that history, they put this in the, in the, the, the first century or so of the church. They had those that were going around that were claiming to be apostles and everything, and they weren't. Why? Well, because they found out that if you went from town to town, they didn't really know who you were. You said, I'm Apostle Bob. And I'm here to, to help you out and everything, take care of me while I'm here for a week and everything, load up my bag and everything, and send me on my way. And there were those that were not sent out, that weren't of the church, that weren't preaching what they were supposed to do, did not have the authority to do that. So they, they, they published back in those days what they called the Didache, and among other things, that pointed out, here's some of the things that you want to watch out for. These guys that are just taking advantage of it. You know, you guys are, are false apostles. The way the church today hopefully recognize those who are false teachers. We studied those, didn't we, and Jude and some of the other books in there. We talked a lot about them. We saw Satan masquerading as an angel of light and his emissaries coming as ministers as of the gospel. And how do we know these who are false apostles, false teachers, false prophets? Because what they do and what they say doesn't line up with the Word of God. And they call them out. They're liars. They're doing pretty good. Verse 3 says you have to persevere and have patience and have labored, labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. They were on track. They were on task. They kept doing it. They ministered. They persevered even in spite of the persecution. They kept doing what they were supposed to do as church. They kept ministering. They kept doing it. And they did it for the Lord's sake, not for theirs, but for His name's sake. They did these things. They persevered. They were patient. They kept on going. They labored for His name's sake. Sometimes we do church if it's convenient. How many of you ever, have ever been in that situation where you move someplace and for whatever reason you're looking for another church? How many of at the top of your list of things that you're looking for in a church says close by, nice and convenient, easy to get to? The church of convenience. Churches too often these days have been become more of a, a situation where you're, it, it's a consumer market out there. I've talked to people time after time. Well, you know, I'm looking for this in a church and I'm looking for that. And that's okay. You, 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 if you've got a family and all that stuff, you need to consider those things. But it becomes a consumer thing. Well, you know, those guys have over the beacon. they got blue chairs and I prefer red. So let's go down the street and believe me. It gets that way. 
this church kept doing what it was doing. They were persevering in spite of the persecution, doing it for the Lord's sake, laboring on. It wasn't convenient to be a Christian. Sometimes it's not now. We look at this and we, we look at, at, at the world around us today. You know, it's pretty convenient. All you got to do is decide what channel you want to watch and who you want to look at. They labored in His name, say, and did not become weary. Easy to get weary in laboring for the Lord. The Bible tells us to do good and not to grow weary in doing good. But the thing that causes us to get to that place where we grow weary in doing good is because those who we do good to don't respond the way we want them to. You ever notice that? And we go, well, never mind. And that shows us there that we're not doing what we're doing for the Lord's sake, are we? Do you do what you do as unto the Lord? Sometimes it's difficult. One of the, the things that, that, that can be difficult as a pastor sometimes is to not let the sheep distract you from the shepherd. It can happen. But you do these things as unto the Lord. They did it for His namesake. They persevered. They labored for His namesake. And they did not become weary. They kept going. They were determined. Even in the face of the difficulties. They start out pretty good in here. It says, Nevertheless, in verse 4, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, where you have, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will consume you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Sometimes that first love and the excitement that goes along with it and everything grows a little stale. You get used to it. You start taking things for granted. And you go and you do this thing. They're doing the right stuff. They're laboring and everything. And they're doing it for the Lord's sake. And they're not getting, growing weary and everything. They're doing it. Why? Because this is what we have to do. You ever do stuff for the Lord because this is what you have to do? Because it's your Christian duty? Sometimes those things that we do, that we begin to do because of the, the love of our hearts turns into the things that we do because we've always done them, we're supposed to do them, and that's the way it is. And we do them with great zeal but no love. 1 Corinthians, it tells us that we can do all these things, bestow all of our goods, and lay down our lives and do all that stuff. But if we do them without love, they don't mean anything. They're pointless and useless. So telling your church in Ephesus, man, you guys got it. You're doing the right stuff. But your motivation is gone. The reason you're doing it is not the same. You've left your first love. We were talking about our anniversaries and stuff earlier over there in the in the in the next door and all that. I told my dad, I told uh, told dad, I said, Yeah, I, I never forget my anniversary. Not always on the same day every year, but I don't forget it. <laughs> we talk about those and we mark those things and they're important to us. Why? Because it reminds us of that time, that first love. Yeah? Married couples every once in a while want to go out and get, to, you know, get the wedding album with the photos and stuff out. And pay. I want to go back and remember those things. That first love. 
And sometimes we as Christians, we as believers, we get so busy doing church that we forget to worship the Lord. We forget to worship the, the Lord. We can get so busy in the things that we do, the jobs that we have, and our, our part and purpose and everything, and the, the ritual of the whole thing that it becomes a mundane act. And we forget that our what we're doing is worshiping the Lord. We forget to focus on Him. We have to come back and remember who He is. To admire and to adore the Lord Jesus Christ. He talks back over here in chapter 1. He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the one who, who lives and was dead. And behold, I live again forever. Remember? Remember who Jesus is? Remember why we do this? Is it an act of worship? Or has it become Christian duty? talked about it as we looked at those things about being a mature Christian and everything. We went back into to Malachi and all that. And all the service that they were doing was meaningless ritual. Yeah, you know, it's like, why are we doing this? I don't know. They told us we're supposed to, so that's what we do. It becomes meaningless ritual instead of meaningful worship. Worship does that Pros to do that kissing towards and responding to the love of the Lord. You forget about that. You can do the right things, but you lose that first love. You left your first love. Remember there from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove the lampstand from its place unless you repent. Remember, the more you have fallen. Remember sin. Remember your sin. Remember how Jesus was brutally beaten and whipped and nailed to a cross for your sin. Remember from where you have fallen and the love that He showed us as He hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Sometimes we need to remember that. that the only reason that we are the church is because of His grace and His mercy. That He Dying on the cross so that we could become the body of Christ. He gave himself for us. Remember from where we have fallen and repent and do the first works. Go back to that first love. Remember the love that Jesus has shown us and respond to that. We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. Return to those things. Repent from those things, he said. Or I'm going to remove your lampstand. Because all you are is some organization, no longer a church, the organism, the living body of Christ, because you're not doing the things that you're doing because of your love for Him. The lampstand has been removed. The light is out. And there are many churches. We can, you can probably think of several of them. There are lots of churches that are in that very same place. They are an organization that calls themselves a church of some sort or another. They do what they do out of tradition and because they always have and they do it very diligently. But without love for the one who saved them. The lampstand is gone and is no longer an organism. The body of Christ. The living body of Christ. And you're simply left an organization much like any other. You can do the right things. Lord, we've cast out demons. We've done all these things in your name. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. For I never knew you. 
I don't plan to hang around to find out, but I can guarantee you that the Sunday immediately following the rapture, there will be churches that will meet without with hardly any notice of those missing. But very few gone. Why? Because they are this church that has not repented from the empty works to responding to the love of Christ. And the lamp stand is gone. And they will continue in their empty works diligently. Laboring diligently to know that because the light of Christ is gone. But just I have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Nicolaitans is something that's very difficult. We don't see much of it, anything in the scripture that tells us what this is. One tradition is that it's the, the, the hierarchy in the church. You get the idea from like the, the, the Catholic church where the, the clergy were far more spiritual and everything than the laity. Um, people. The Catholic Church had the idea at one point that, well, you, you people out there, you can't read the Bible. Don't drive you crazy. That's gross. That's the kind of idea that we get from the, 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 the laity. Jesus says we're all the same, aren't we? Doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, what you've been. We're all the same in Christ. We have our different parts and jobs and placement in the body of Christ. And we need to do that. But none are any more valuable or any more spiritual than anyone else. You don't place them above. You've been given our jobs, and sometimes that comes with certain authorities and everything, but that does not make that person more loved by or more spiritual or more, more value than anyone else in the church. This is the thing that was creeping into that early church. Oh boy, that guy, you know, he's, he's, he's an apostle. He's a bishop. He's a whatever title you want to throw on there. They're so much more spiritual than we are. Really? And you know what? People like that. The ones that are lifted up in that way. He says, you don't like that stuff. You hate that. And that's good. Verse 7. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you have an ear? To listen, to hear what the Holy Spirit says? Do you have that ear? Are you saved? Are you born again? Do you have the Holy Spirit walking? Do you have that ear? Do you listen? Do you hear? He who has an ear, let him hear. And it says here, but the idea is listen what the Holy Spirit says. I mean, you know that there's a difference between the, the simple act of hearing and the act of listening. The yeah, April does. <laughs> and I have it in today. I got, got my, my hearing aid and everything. And got the hearing aids and she, you know, one of the first things I had to remind her of honey, these are hearing aids, not listening aids. <laughs> you know, listen, that was not a point on my part, but you have it here. And him who have an ear, let him who knows and hear, let him listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To him who overcomes, how do we overcome? By trusting in our Lord Jesus Christ. By walking and following the Lord. By denying ourselves. Taking up our cross, following Jesus. By being doers of the word, not just hearers only. By doing what we do for Christ's sake. By doing all things as unto the Lord. Why? Because we love Him. Because He first loved us. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, that the Lord, those whom you love, you love enough to chasten. 
Lord, that you came and you, you came and you met us where we were. And you offered us forgiveness and the gift of life. Well, Lord, thank you and praise you, Lord, that you love us too much to leave us as we are. And Father, we may know the things and the right things to do. We may have once had that great love for you. That sometimes things in life become mundane, even the things we do for you. We begin to take things for granted. Lord, bring us back and make us mindful of that place of that first love. But we were head over hills in love with you, Jesus. Remind us of the love that you've given us. And let us once again respond to that. Let what we do, everything we do, Lord, be that act of worship. That kissing towards you, Lord Jesus. Let us remember that first one. In your name we pray. Amen.